بارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. Your brothers and sisters, inshallah ta'ala, today is a great day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He has gathered us in this place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us in Al-Firdaus Al-A'la around our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He accept all of our du'as today and always. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that by the time the sun sets tonight that we are amongst those who have been completely forgiven for their sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written down for us Al-Itq min an nar to be completely freed from the fire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He accept the hajj of those that are doing hajj and those that intended to do hajj and those that intend to do hajj in the future. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us all. Allahumma ameen. Inshallah ta'ala, today to begin, we're just going to talk about some of the fada'il, some of the virtues of this dua, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al mulk wa lahu al hamd, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. And I want you, as you are sitting here, inshallah ta'ala, to keep repeating it to yourself even as you're listening to me, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, speak about the virtues of it because the more that you recite it, the better, insha'Allah ta'ala. So even if you recite it silently and to yourself, then keep doing so bi idnillahi ta'ala. And when we talk about the virtues of this dua and the deeper meanings of this dua, it starts off with the very first part of it, which is la ilaha illallah. There is no better dhikr, no better remembrance than la ilaha illallah alone. The Prophet some said in one narration, it's the best of what he and the Prophets have been guided to. La ilaha illallah, just in terms of a general statement. La ilaha illallah. It is kalimat al-ikhlas, it is the statement of sincerity. When the believer says it, it goes straight to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So long as a person does not block it with any of their own major sins or anything else that would taint it. It is the key to gaining the intercession of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment. It is the kalima, the word that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will argue on behalf of people on the day of judgment with. It is the card that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that as a person is standing in front of their mizan, in front of their scales, that if the heavens and the earth were to be placed within those scales, it would weigh them accurately, it will hold them accurately. And when a person sees that the side of their sins has stacked up, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling us that that one card of la ilaha illallah, if it is placed in the scale of our good deeds, would send the other scale with the records flying into the air. It is heavier than any other word. It is heavier than any other deed. La ilaha illallah. And I don't want that to be lost as we start in one narration, because remember, this is a renewal of our covenant today. The day of Arafah, every year, is a chance for us to renew our covenant from the first moment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we said, Yes, you are, O Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Jaddidu imanakum. In one narration, Muslim Imam Ahmad, Jaddidu imanakum, renew your faith. Qila, Ya Rasulullah, wa kayfa nujaddidu imanana. They said, O Messenger of Allah, and how do we renew our faith? Qala akthiru min qawli la ilaha illallah. Keep on reciting la ilaha illallah. Akthiru min shahadati an la ilaha illallah. In one narration, the Prophet said, continue to recite la ilaha illallah qabla an yuhala baynakum wa baynaha. Beautiful narration. It's an authentic hadith. The Prophet said, before it is separated from you, or there is a separation between you and it, not a separation from la ilaha illallah in your heart. What is the Prophet speaking about? Death. Death. Before death comes between you and the ability to repeat it over and over and over again. Before death comes, continue to recite la ilaha illallah. It is al qawl al thabit. It is the firm word that the Prophet ﷺ said, we prompt our dying ones to say, La ilaha illallah, and that a person hopes to have on their tongue and on their heart 
at the moment of death. Allahumma thabbitna inda al-mawti bi la ilaha illallah. O Allah, grant us steadfastness, the ability to say with all of our being on the day of judgment, la, on, on the day of our death, la ilaha illallah. Because it is the hardest thing to say when a person is dying. It's not easy to say la ilaha illallah. You have to keep on saying it while you are healthy and living and while you don't fear that death is around the corner from you. But when death comes to a person, it is la ilaha illallah that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned is a form of martyrdom. That if the person, whoever makes the last of their words, la ilaha illallah, they would enter into paradise. They would be guaranteed entrance into paradise. And so it's the dua that you hope to be saying at the time of death. The dhikr that you hope to be saying at the time of death. It is the dhikr that opens all eight gates of Jannah. When the person finishes their wudu, and they say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh that they bear witness to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the messengership of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Prophet sallallahu said that one word opens all eight gates of Jannah. Now everything beyond that is constructing upon la ilaha illallah. al Hafid ibn Rajab rahimahullah ta'ala he said that the best du'as are the ones that are constructed upon the most famous and most oft-repeated athkar, the most famous and oft-repeated uh, forms of remembrance. Why is that important? Because a lot of times you see people looking for a book, you see people trying to cling and say, how do I remember this very poetic du'a? How do I remember how to say this? How do I remember to say that? And what did the Prophet ﷺ say to the companion that came to him, afraid that maybe he was being left behind because he was not able to say as poetically as the Prophet ﷺ that supplication. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him what he is doing and he's saying, I'm just saying la ilaha illallah and subhanallah and alhamdulillah Allahu Akbar. The very common phrases that we learn from the athkar and the Prophet ﷺ said that's all that we do and we just build upon it. And so set the foundation of your dua as la ilaha illallah, as subhanallah, as alhamdulillah, as Allahu Akbar and then build upon that. And when it comes to la ilaha illallah, we know that the Prophet ﷺ taught us that the du'as that are constructed upon la ilaha illallah are the ones that remove any type of hardship. Not just the hardship of this world, but the hardship of the hereafter as well. La ilaha illallah is the removal of all hardship in this life and in the next. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that when a person is in hardship, the du'a that they are to say is what? La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. See how simple that is? Dua of our Prophet or the brother of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu the Prophet Jonah, Yunus alayhi salam, his brother, Yunus alayhi salam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, no one says, la ilaha la anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimeen, except that their hardship will be removed. It's also authentically narrated that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say at times of distress, La ilaha illallah al-Azim al-Halim, La ilaha illallah Rabb al-Samawati wal-Ard, wa Rabb al-Arsh al-Azim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say, La ilaha illallah al-Azim al-Halim. Okay, very simple. La ilaha illallah Rabb al-Samawati wal-Ard, wa Rabb al-Arsh al-Azim. These are things that we can remember insha'Allah ta'ala and all they are is the construction upon the word of Tawheed and the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the specific request that you make in that particular dua. Now when we come to why this dhikr, which we'll start to break down insha'Allah ta'ala, is so important and so embedded in the Hajj ritual in particular. The ulama mentioned that Hajj is the greatest affirmation of Tawheed. Everything about Hajj, every single ritual of Hajj is meant to imprint Tawheed in the heart of the person who is performing that Hajj. Every single ritual of it. قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say, verily my prayer and my sacrifice, my life and my death, are all for the Lord of the worlds. La sharika lah. Pay attention now to some of the common phrases that you're going to hear. La sharika lah. He has no sharik, no partner. He is one and he needs no help. 
So that's the first thing that I want you to understand. No one shares in creating, no one shares in his lordship. Not only is he one in his essence, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he needs absolutely no one. He is not dependent on, upon, upon anyone. Ibn Abbas ta'ala says something very powerful about la sharika lah. He said that most people, most philosophies, most groups of people and nations that took the path of associating directly a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worshiping him, started off by weakening their perception of God and saying that Allah needs someone to do this or Allah needs someone to do that or assigning a power that belongs only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to something or someone else. And then at that point, eventually your adoration to that partner or to that helper becomes to the point that you elevate that thing to being God itself. And then you start to outright say, that there are two gods, or three gods, or four gods, or five gods. And that's how the path of the most obvious and blatant committal of shirk is. That a person elevates something to a sharik of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to a partner of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so here in particular, my sacrifice is mentioned. And that is the sacrifice that we will inshallah ta'ala be partaking in within the next few days. And so here you hear la sharika la, right? When a person is doing the talbiya, which is the dhikr that you recite as you are going towards station to station within hajj, from station to station. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaika, la sharika laka labbaik. Okay? Here I come, O oh Allah, here I come. I'm, at, I'm, I'm listening to you, I am hearing you, I have arrived as you have commanded me to arrive, and I am not affirming any partner besides you. You're going to hear la sharika lah a lot within the athkar of hajj. Why? Because did they used to perform hajj in the days of ignorance? Yes. But they elevated all of these idols to where they negated the entire purpose of the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so the Prophet sallallahu constantly affirming la sharika lah as he goes along, along the way is very powerful. Inna alhamda wa ni'mata. Verily, all praise and all blessings belong to you, O Allah. Laka wal mulk, and to you belongs the complete dominion over all things, which we'll talk about in a moment, inshallah ta'ala. La sharika lak. The only thing you're saying twice within this talbiya, right? Within this dua. There is no partner with you. We have no hope in anyone but you. We seek help from no one but you. You are the one who relieves distress. No one else relieves distress besides you, O oh Allah. La sharika lak. It comes throughout these ad'iyah, throughout these uh, remembrances. Now let's get to our dua for the day, inshallah ta'ala. If you realize this dua that we say so regularly is basically a rearrangement of the talbiyah. All of the words and the concepts that are mentioned in the talbiyah, in the chant of hajj, are embedded within this particular dhikr, within this particular remembrance that we do in these days. The concept that the Prophet ﷺ gives us, khayru du'a'i du'a yawmi arafah, that the best du'a is the du'a of the day of Arafah. Wa khayru ma qultu, ana wa nabiyuna min qabli, la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamd, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. The scholars say that when the Prophet ﷺ gives us things of this nature, these are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to conceal from previous nations. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was unjust to these nations, but these are from the gifts of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to this particular ummah, such as when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions that there is no prophet that came before me except that they warned you of a dajjal But I will tell you something about a dajjal that no other prophet mentioned, and that is that Dajjal is one-eyed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not as such. Right? So this is one of the gifts of the Prophet وسلم, is that through him, a very specific description of the Dajjal which, who was warned about by every Prophet is given through the Prophet <clears throat> And so there are certain things that we were guided to, like the day of Friday. 
It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our Prophet وسلم, that we were guided to Yawm al Jumu'ah, the best day of the week. Likewise, when the Prophet وسلم, says that every Prophet, every Prophet stood on this day and remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so I'm going to share with you the best thing that we have all said, all 100,000 plus Prophets on this day. Because you're going to watch me on the day of Arafah and see me making dua from the time of Dhuhr all the way to the time of Maghrib and think, what is he saying? What is the Prophet Sallallahu saying for all of these hours? Let me try to write it down. Let me try to see if I can sneak in and hear. Let me see if I can follow the movement of his mouth or his lips or his beard and see if I can catch what he's saying. So the Prophet Sallallahu is saying, look, the best thing that I or the Prophets have ever said, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. So let's start to break it down, inshaAllah ta'ala. La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. We already have covered that part of this uh, dua. Wahdahu is ta'keed, is a form of um, exaggerating or a form of adding to the already stated oneness of God. He is one. There is no God but Him. One. Wahdahu la sharika lah. So you negate anything that even ambiguously or even in a subtle way shares any of the divine essence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Negate all of it. Anything that is attributed to a human being is not attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any human feature or human deficiency is not attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is completely one. Ahad. Wahdahu. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la sharika la has absolutely no one or nothing that he needs in order to carry out what he carries out of his lordship. So you are negating la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la any partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his being, any partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his doing. La sharika la is the doing part, okay? La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la lahul mulk, lahul mulk. To him belongs all of the dominion. Al-mulk is anything that could possibly be owned, is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tabaraka alladhi biyadihi al-mulk wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Anything that has a possessor is possessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether someone else possesses it in some limited or temporary fashion, whether it is observable or not observable, whether it is time or place, whether it is the being, people or things that are seen or things that are not seen. So what does it mean when you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has al-mulk? Okay, this is part of Allah's mulk, all of this. You might own your home, your car, whatever it is, Allah allowed you to be a caretaker of it but ultimately it is part of the dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah owns you and Allah owns what you own. Al-mulk also, قُلِلَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ Say, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh God, مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ the, the, the one who possesses all things, the entire dominion. Okay? What does the ayah go on to say? What does it go on to say? It's very important. قُلِلَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتَنْزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مِمَّنْ تَشَاءُ You give of your possession what you will. So whatever you're going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, if you're not starting with the bare minimum of understanding that what Allah gives you, you are not entitled to, then don't even ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. Because you have a deficiency in your understanding of God before you can ask of God. So the very first thing, تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتَنْزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مِمَّنْ تَشَاءُ You take it from who you will. If you take it, I have no right to say, Oh Allah, you took this from me. That's very important because when you're making dua, some people make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if Allah owes them. And we call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with certainty in our dua, but not with a sense of arrogance in our dua. That's why when a person is raised up on the Day of Judgment without their sight, لِمَا حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا They make a claim against the law and say, why did you take away my sight? You raised me blind and I used to be able to see. It's not. That was never of your mulk in the first place. So anything you ask of Allah and He gives to you is a bestowal of His favor. And anything He takes away from you is not out of hatred or punishment 
or despisal of you, but that is for a wisdom that is also not possessed by you. SubhanAllah, you don't have the possession of the wisdom to understand why things are given or why things are taken. So the very first understanding or implication of this possession, this dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what He gives and what He takes. And when we're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're asking Him to bestow upon us and not to take, right? Of this life or of the next. And so that's what makes this so powerful to affirm Al-Mulk, Laka wal-Mulk. بِيَدِهِ mulk To Allah belongs the possession, the dominion of all things. بِيَدِهِ mulk الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَسُلْطَانِهِمَا As the ulama mentioned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the possession of this dunya and of the hereafter and the control, the authority over all of those things. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma he says بِيَدِهِ mulk يَعِزُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَذِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ To him belongs the dominion over all things. He honors whom he wills and he disgraces whom he wills. And he gives life and he gives death and he gives wealth and he gives poverty or he withholds. He gives and he takes. This is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la lahul mulk. Everything that you're going to ask Allah, you need to first remember that it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not you. Walahul hamd. وَلَهُ الْحَمْدِ And to him belongs all hamd. Alhamdulillah. All praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when we talk about alhamd, when we say to Allah belongs all hamd, all praise, hamd comprises of two things. athana wa shukr. Praise and gratitude. Hamd is to say, when you, is to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of who he is and to thank him for who he is as well and what he gives as well. So hamd is comprehensive in that it brings together athana wa shukur, praise as well as gratitude. And subhanAllah, there is something really interesting here because remember the Prophet is giving us a secret here, a dua that is very special. I'm gonna ask you a question. Is la ilaha illallah primarily a dhikr or a dua? Is it a form of remembrance or a form of supplication? I can't hear anybody, I just hear mumbling. It's a form of dhikr, remembrance. Is alhamdulillah primarily a form of dhikr or a form of dua? It's actually a primarily a form of supplication. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions is in an authentic hadith, afdalu dhikr, la ilaha illallah wa afdalu dua, alhamdulillah. The best form of dhikr the best thing that you could say with your tongue and with your heart at any moment in life is La ilaha illallah. The best dua that you can make, the best supplication that you can make is Alhamdulillah. And so immediately this remembrance combines the best remembrance and the best supplication. Why did the ulama mention that Alhamdulillah is primarily a supplication? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala in shakartum. If you are grateful, I will increase you. Also, the fact that the dua that we make in every single salah, Surah Al-Fatiha, begins with this particular supplication. And so it is, yes, supplication and remembrance, but primarily it is supplication. And this particular dhikr combines both of these in such a beautiful way. Al-Hafid ibn Rajab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he also says, that hamd is the price of every ni'mah in this life. It's the price of every blessing in this life. And tahleel, la ilaha illallah, is the key to jannah in the next. Alhamdulillah is the payment for every blessing that Allah gives you in this life. And la ilaha illallah is the key to jannah in the next. So how beautiful is it when the Prophet ﷺ combines both of them for us? La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير. And Allah has power over all things. Omnipotent, dominion, power over all things. Al-Qadir, Al-Qadir, Al-Muqtadir. He is Qadir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able. Whatever challenge is put forth, whatever particular ask that you have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Qadir. Allah is able to do exactly and more. He is Qadir. 
the things you don't even think about. When you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows them and it is all part of His power and His wisdom and His dominion. Realize when you ask Allah, because I'm only going to speak about Al-Qadir right now in the, in, the, in the context of dua, and then inshaAllah ta'ala move on. Why? Because realize the limitations of your ask of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The limitations of your ask is that you are asking Allah to grant you something on the basis of your understanding which is inherently limited. So, oh Allah, give me this, oh Allah, give me that. But you're not considering certain things, nor are you tasked with considering certain things because you don't see everything and you don't understand everything. But don't think, what's the, what's, what's the trick of shaitan when a person makes dua? If you don't get it, you start to question the existence of God and why is God doing this to me? On the basis of what? The limitation that you went to your supplication with in the first place. You can't take everything into consideration because you don't know everything. You don't have everything. Allah has everything, Allah knows everything, Allah is capable over all things. So before you even get to that point of questioning, yeah Allah, it's been a year. Last Arafah they said, make this dua, I made that dua, it didn't happen. Oh Allah, why? وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ You weren't listening to the last part of your own dhikr. Allah has power over all things. Do not think that if Allah is withholding from you, it is because Allah is not able to give you. وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ لَهُ الْمُلْكُ وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Now inshaAllah Ta'ala, I will end with this, the rewards. The Prophet Sallallahu said, مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَا لَهُ الْمُلْكُ وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ عَشْرَ مِرَارًا كَانَ كَمَنْ أَعْتَقَ أَرْبَعَةَ أَنفُسِ مِنْ وَلَدِ إِسْمَعِيلٍ The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever says, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ لَهُ الْمُلْكُ وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Ten times, in the morning or in the evening, he is like one who has freed four slaves from the children of Ismail. Four believing slaves. How long does it take you to say that phrase ten times? Less than a minute. Imagine if you had the reward of freeing four slaves. SubhanAllah, what a, what, four believing slaves, what a reward to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. What a day's work. People would work all day so that they could have the ajr, the reward of being able to free someone from captivity. And to properly understand this, and by the way, one of the narrations of this, which is very beautiful, uh, Abu Ayyash, who's one of the narrators, he, the, the person who narrated from him, he saw the Prophet ﷺ in a dream. And he heard this dua, and it was so amazing that when he saw the Prophet ﷺ in a dream, and he realized that the Prophet ﷺ was in front of him, قَالَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ أَبَا عَيَّاشْ يَرْوِي عَنْكَ كَذَا وَكَذَا Ya Rasulullah, Abu Ayyash is making this claim that you said this and that. <laughs> like, that's incredible. Is it true that you said that, Ya Rasulullah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Sadaqa Abu Ayyash. So the narrator was comfortable. Abu Ayyash has told the truth. Not that the Sanad of Hadith, the chain of Hadith is ever based on dreams, but subhanAllah, like, this is what a man is thinking about when he sees the Prophet ﷺ in a dream. Like, Ya Rasulullah, a phrase that we say in a minute, ten times, and it's like freeing four slaves? That's incredible. Why? Because the reward of freeing a slave, which subhanAllah, we don't take into consideration. Zadan, he says, I came to Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa qad a'taqa mamlukan and he had just freed a slave. فَأَخَذَ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ عُودًا أَوْ شَيْئًا فَقَالْ مَا لِي فِيهِ مِنَ الْأَجْرِ مَا يَسْوَ هَذَا He took something from the earth and he said, there is nothing in this world that equals the reward of this. Nothing in this world that equals the reward of this. And what is the reward of freeing the slave? The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَعْتَقَ رَقَبَ مُؤْمِنَ أَعْتَقَ اللَّهُ مِنْهُ بِكُلِّ عُدْوًا مِنْهُ عُدْوًا مِنَ النَّارِ حَتَّى يُعْتِقَ فَرْجَهُ بِفَرْجِهِ SubhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever frees a believing slave from captivity, Allah will free every single part of him, not missing any part, even the private parts, meaning even the concealed parts, from hellfire. And what's the greatest ask on the day of Arafah? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us from al-utaqa, from those who are freed from the fire. So the Prophet ﷺ said that's the reward of freeing one person. What about the reward of freeing four? 
And there are multiple ahadith. The Prophet said, the greatest sadaqah that you can give is to intercede on behalf of a slave with his master until his master frees him. Ibn Rajab rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, tahqeet, kalimat tawheed, yujibu itqa riqab. So if a person understands la ilaha illallah properly, then that will mandate upon them to free people from captivity. And when a person frees people from captivity, that mandates that they are freed from hellfire as well. It gets better. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, قَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ لَلَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَا لَهُ الْمُلْكُ وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ فِي يَوْمٍ مِئَةَ مَرَّةَ كَانَتْ لَهُ عَدْلَ عَشْرِ رِقَابٍ وَكُتِبَتْ لَهُ مِئَةُ حَسَنَةٍ وَمُحْيَتْ عَنْهُ مِئَةُ سَيِّئَةٍ وَكَانَتْ لَهُ حِرْزًا مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ يَوْمَهُ ذَلِكَ حَتَّى يُمْسِي وَلَمْ يَأْتِ أَحَدٌ بِأَفْضَلَ مِمَّا جَاءَ بِهِ إِلَّا رَجُلٌ عَمِلَ أَكْثَرَ مِنْهُ The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says this dhikr a hundred times, لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير A hundred times in a day. By the way, Imam Nawawi rahimahullah says it doesn't have to be in one sitting. So it could be throughout the day. Ten minutes of your day. Imagine the Prophet said it is like a person who walked and who freed ten slaves from captivity. Ten slaves from captivity. And Allah writes down for them 100 hasanat. And Allah removes from them 100 sayyat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide that person from protection from the shaitan for the entirety of that day. And the Prophet said, no one can possibly outdo this person except for a person who outdoes them with this dhikr, with this remembrance, who says it more to them. Meaning what? You're from the firsts. The ulama say, the Prophet is saying, you're from al-sabiqoon al-awwaloon on the Day of Judgment. You're from the forerunners on the Day of Judgment. If you just say this a hundred times a day, that's on a regular day. What about on the day of Arafah, the best day of du'a, where this is the best dhikr? I have so much more uh, to say here. I'll simply say quickly that this is also the du'a that the Prophet would say after every salah and in numerous ways. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, maybe one day we will uh, we'll, we'll build upon it. But there are numerous narrations of the Prophet saying this after every salah, but he didn't stop there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would construct upon uh, this du'a in, uh, in various ways. The Prophet would say this in a safa or marwa. The Prophet would say this after a battle or when he came upon a high place, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Any high place, he looked up and he would do takbir and he would say these words, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu would say this upon entering into the marketplace, taught us to do so. The Prophet sallallahu said that a person says this when they wake up at night. All of these different narrations about the times to say this, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we will cover them uh, sometime in the near future, but in the night ta'ala. But for now, keep on saying this dua throughout the day. لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from all of you and from all of us May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow our du'as today to be a means of the removal of distress from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a means of uplifting the oppressed and the wronged all around the world a means by which we are forgiven for our own wrongdoings and for our own transgressions a means by which we are written amongst those who are freed from any type of punishment, a means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enters us in the presence of the prophets, the martyrs, the righteous ones around our, our, our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in al-firdaws al-a'la. Allahumma ameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah ta'ala. Um, <coughs> Sunrise, wait 15 minutes, inshallah ta'ala, make your askar, and then inshallah.